sensors and actuators. By way of introduction, um, Hung Ri is an assistant professor at um, University of Wisconsin. He received his PhD from Cornell University in 2001. His thesis advisor was Norman Tien. He received a master's degree from Cornell University in 1999 and received a bachelor's degree from Peking University in Beijing, China in 1995. He was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California, Berkeley, BSAC from uh, 2001 to 2002. And there he worked under the tutelage of both Norman Tian and Roger Howe. So clearly he has uh, a distinguished lineage in the MEMS field. Professor Zhang has published extensively in MEMS, and I'm sure we're going to see a lot of examples in today's presentation. His publication record is outstanding. In fact, he's published in all of the leading MEMS journals, including JMEMS, Advanced Materials, Applied Physics Letters, and Nature. And in at least three occasions, his work was featured on the cover, most notably on the cover of Nature, which is a really uh, a tough accomplishment to achieve. Thank you. He's also had uh, uh, papers published in Lab on a Chip, and I believe he had a cover article on Lab on a Chip as well. So um, his work is. In, in, in addition to being uh, technically very sound, it's visually very savvy, otherwise the cover <laughs> art does, doesn't happen. Needless to say, he also presents at all the leading MEMS conferences, including Hilton Head, Transducers, MEMS, Sensors, and the like. So it great, gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Zhang. Professor Zhang. Thank you, Chris. Wow, it's, uh, it's a great introduction. I didn't know that person. Um, um, OK, so this is the. Um, uh, uh, my second talk right here, it's a great pleasure to come back to CASE to give another talk uh, after six months. I promise there's going to be new stuff in it in case you attended my last talk back in um, September last year. Today I'm going to talk more towards the sensors and actuators side of our work uh, based on microfluidics. Um, uh, here's the outline of the whole talk. I'll briefly introduce uh, the motivation of, this, of the work. And uh, there are three kinds of words I'm going to talk about. One is the liquid microlenses formed through uh, microfluidic interfaces. I'll start with the biologically inspired adaptive liquid microlenses and talk about the application of these kind of lenses to endo endoscopes, fiber endoscopes, specifically uh, using infrared light responsive um, liquid microlenses. And the second topic is microsensing using microfluid interfaces, uh, chemical and biological sensing. Uh, there are uh, two types. One is with the dissolvable micromembranes. The other one is at the liquid crystal interfaces. And um, sensing is often one thing. And sometimes people overlook uh, the other aspect of um, the complete sensor system, that is the collection. Uh, so I'm, I'm also uh, talk briefly about some of uh, our work in the collection of uh, gas samples and aerosols through air liquid, air to liquid microfluidic interfaces. Lastly, uh, uh, I'm going to introduce a, an interesting work um, using smart sti sti stimuli responsive hydrogels as uh, microactuators to realize uh, autonomous uh, fluidic handling. One example I'm going to uh, give is the uh, micro coolers on chip. Uh, autonomous microcoolers on chip. And I'll, finally, I'll, I'll conclude with summary and acknowledgement. Uh, let me talk briefly about the whole motivation of this work. Uh, we have heard a lot of buzzword about the lab on the chip technology these days. It's a very, very promising, profound field that involves many, many multi, uh, areas, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. Uh, many applications have been shown, for instance, PCR, immunoassay, and uh, the, uh, very interesting works obviously have been uh, produced. Um, this is not a comprehensive overview of this. I just want to sort of, um, as an appetizer, but what I'm interested in uh, in, in this uh, 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 whole large, uh, vast field is one is fluidic manipulation in small volumes, used, uh, such as pumping, mixing, separation, etc. And we have been working on pumping and mixing. The second part is the micro-optical imaging using variable focus microlenses, or uh, large, uh, roughly falling into a larger area, area called optofluidics, which is a word coined between optics and the fluidics. And finally, of course, sensing. Lab on the chip technologies revolve around the microfluidics. Microfluidics, as it's 
as, as the word suggests, is the uh, control of small volume of fluids around the micro, uh, micro liter towards the picoliter uh, in, micro, uh, in micro channels. So micro channels means a sub, uh, sub millimeter, millimeter towards sub millimeter, hundreds of microns, all the way down to about 20, 10 microns. Um, Microfluid uh, promises reduced amount of reagents, high precision and sensitivity, small size, lower power consumption, and fast uh, bio and chemical analysis. And uh, the idea is that eventually will replace the uh, long, tedious uh, manual operation uh, that requires skillful uh, operators, like technicians, as well as uh, very expensive instruments. Uh, the microfluidics. The main difference between microfluidics and the macro scale fluidics that we are more familiar with, the physics, the governing equations are the same, but it's different extre uh, extremities, it's different regimes. Uh, in microfluidics, the uh, diffusion is dominant in the uh, behavior. The surface area to volume uh, ratio is much larger. And uh, these two are more interesting to us because this is the more uh, central to our work uh, presented here, that is the laminar flow. It's really hard to produce torrent in microfluidics because the Reynolds number is much smaller than one uh, compared to the micro scale, macro scale. Um, and surface tension is a dominant force compared with the most other forces, for instance, gravity. Um, the work we have, uh, the technique wise, is based on the controlled microfluidic interfaces. These controlled microfluid interfaces can be multi-phase, for instance, uh, gas to liquid or liquid to liquid. When it comes to liquid to liquid, it can either be miscible or immiscible. Um, but these interfaces, the key is they are at the micro scale. They can be used for sensing optofluidics, uh, sample uh, optofluidics, sensing sample handling, and uh, in situ fabrication of uh, functional particles. Uh, but today, this, this is where I'm going to focus on. Let me start with the, uh, the first topic, the microlenses formed through microfluid interfaces. The start will be the biology-inspired adapt adaptive liquid microlenses, followed by the discussion of these lenses in uh, uh, implementation of these lenses in fiber optics. As Chris said, this, this, the whole thing started with our uh, adventure, uh, accident, accidental fi finding, and eventually landed in, uh, in nature. Uh, let me uh, start with the motivation of using variable focus microlenses. Micro lenses are important in all, all kinds of optical systems. Uh, in most uh, systems, we will require the focal lens tuning. Traditionally, this is done in a micro scale, is done through mechanical systems such as gears, rails, motors. For instance, in a micro microscope, you actually uh, turn it up. Uh, for micro lenses and micro optic systems, you need to scale down and integrate all these discrete components. That presents a huge challenge in terms of fabrication, integration, and power consumption, all those kind of things. Uh, there are a few tunable uh, lens technologies right now to remove mechanical components, uh, save, uh, save space, and reduce price. Um, these, here are some uh, potential applications of these, for instance, in the cell phones, in the surveillance systems, in the laparoscopes, in the, which is a medical uh, tool that we are briefly going to brush upon. We're going to talk about the endoscopes, but the idea is similar. Uh, so they have many applications, but let me just bring one that, uh, that is most re relevant to our work, which is endoscopy. Uh, endoscopy is a minimally invasive di diagnostic medical procedure uh, used to assess the interior surfaces of an organ uh, by inserting a tube into the body. The endoscopes can be uh, either rigid or flexible, although flexible tubes are used more often right now. Uh, they should have the tube, a light delivery system, a lens system, and additional operating uh, operation channels. They have tons of medical applications, diagnostic and surgical, and tons of uh, non-medical uh, uses. But the challenges of current endoscopes, most of the current endoscopes uses lenses that are fixed at the, uh, at the tip. So basically, you have a fixed focal length lens right at the tip, which is uh, there's uh, no mechanism to, do, to tune it. <laughs> so what they do is that if you want to focus onto the object, the, um, the surgeon, the, endo the endoscopes, endoscopy, endoscopes, needs to uh, maneuver carefully the, uh, the flexible uh, endoscope to the area where it's going to be focused on. 
Uh, that brings to uh, uh, many issues. For instance, it's sometimes it's really hard to manually adjust the focal point just simply because you cannot reach the area because there are tissues <coughs> or, or uh, that is blocking the way. Uh, or sometimes the surface is inhomogeneous or irregular. Uh, the other thing is once you have a fixed length, you have invariable depth of focus and the limited the lateral resolution. There's no, no, no parameters for you to change to, uh, to tune that. And for some, for some uh, uh, other, uh, especially tissues, because it has a highly scattering optical, me it's highly scattering optical uh, medium, uh, it's hard to detect the spec scattering light from the tissue. Um, so let's look at this uh, again and see whether we can come up with some other solutions. Our, we have the positioning, so we can, phys we can basically uh, maneuver in the endoscopes around. But how about we add another uh, parameters to, to play around with? So if we have a tunable focus micro lens, so we can change the shape of the focal length, so thus we can change the f number of the microscope of, of, of the lens. Then we can have variable depth of focus and the ch and the variable lateral resolution. And coupled with the capability to move the lens around, now we have multiple two parameters to play around, and then potentially for we can get higher resolution or a higher quality of the image depending on the application. Uh, there are a few emerging variable focus lens <coughs> technologies. Uh, basically, there are two ways to tune the lens, the focal length. One is change the shape, the geometry of the uh, of the lens, of the curved structure, or you change the refractive index. Of the uh, of the lens, uh, examples include like electro wetting using high voltage to change the uh, uh, surface wettability, to change the shape of the um, the curvature uh, curvature of the liquid involved, or using liquid crystal using electric field or other um, uh, uh, parameters to change the orientation of the uh, molecules uh, for different refractive index. By the way, this one this this uh, mechanism will apply we'll see it in our sensing application as well a little bit later or just use uh, pneumatic control this is basically using uh, pressure to change the, uh, the curvature of the liquid droplets. The drawbacks of this basic involves either high voltage hun about 100 volt, volt or at most 50 volts in most cases large power consumption relatively slow and uh, complicated control systems. So we were asking ourselves, can we reduce this kind of uh, actuation and come up with a better one, which is more elegant? Uh, but uh, we looked into nature for uh, inspiration. This is our own human eye. So we have the iris, we have the lens. And the way we tune, we focus and defocus is by changing the, uh, the, the, the shape of the lens through the ciliary muscles right here. Uh, so it's basically, a ciliary muscle contracts or relax to adjust the tension onto the crystalline lens that we can focus or defocus, uh, depending on the thing we're looking at. Um, so the lesson we learned from this is that if we can find some way to use the miniaturized microactuators to uh, mimic muscular uh, functions, just like the ciliary muscle, that will, be, uh, that will be perfect for the microsystem because in terms of integration. And for that, we found hydrogels. Uh, for this uh, actuation. So basically, hydrogels are a, a family of polymer materials, elastic 3D cross-linked network with water-filled interstitials. Uh, hydrogels can be both responsive or non-responsive to stimuli. Uh, non-responsive ones, we are very familiar. Most of, I think some of you are wearing contact, eye, uh, contact lenses. Those are made of hydrogels. Uh, but we are more interested in the uh, stimuli response of hydrogels, which undergo uh, distinct volumetric change responding to local environmental parameters, for instance, electric field, temperature, pH, humidity, and antigens, glucose, and other kinds of proteins. So that opens a huge door in terms of the biosensing. Um, in terms, uh, so this is a very nice way of converting the chemical energy to mechanical energy. The uh, volumetric change of hydrogel structures can be huge. It can be up to 1,000, 10 to the 3. So that's a very nice way of generating force and uh, work. And uh, so that the hydrogels can be used both as sensors and actuators. If you design it well, you can control the volumetric change. So it's a very good controlled uh, sensors and actuators as well. Another nice thing about this is that we can actually patent these hydrogels just through uh, very uh, traditional uh, photolithography-like procedures, just like patterning negative photoresist, not positive, uh, negative photoresist. So here is how we, come on. Uh oh, <laughs> that's not good. 
Whoops. Okay, let's try again. This never happened to me. Okay, I just tried to uh, go through this and. Um, so w w the pr uh, we use the liquid phase photopolymerization. Uh, it's, so it's very similar to the traditional I-67 MEMS, uh, but we use the microfluidic uh, fabrication platform uh, to pattern both the non-responsive and the responsive, the hydrogels and other structures. Let me see whether this can work not or not. That's interesting. Ooh. It worked well this morning, so it doesn't like me. Come on, you're at the case. It's, it's a good place. Um, OK, uh, let me try to skip this one and see whether it can go. Hmm, that's interesting. OK, I apologize for this, but frankly speaking, I don't know what I'm apologizing for. I guess I don't know what's going on here. But uh, here's, the, uh, uh, here's the structure of the uh, adaptive liquid, uh, liquid micro lenses. Um, so the, the key, basic, the basic idea is this. We have an oil to water interface. There's two kinds of liquid immiscible with each other because of difference in the refractive indices. So a curved interface between these two liquids will generate a lens. And then if somehow you can change the curvature of that interface, you have a tunable lens. To do that, we treat this, this surface hydrophilic and the top surface hydrophobic. So water will, will be attracted right here and pinned at this contact line, hydrophobic to hydrophilic contact line, all right, the boundary. Um, and then it will be pinned there. And then we use the hydrogels when it goes through this volumetric change, it will exert the pressure or release the pressure onto the water droplet that's making the oil to water interface either bulging up or coming down, okay? And that is our tunable lens. And then the rest is the uh, microfluidic channels to, to deliver the, uh, the fluid in and out. Oh, this is really upsetting. <laughs> um, okay. I don't know what's going on here, but. Sorry about that. Um, so in terms of fabrication, I won't go into details, but the key here is, I want to show that, is that we use oxygen, oxygen plasma to treat the surface to, to make the polymer surface hydrophilic. And then when it's flipped over, we we'll treat this surface with, with OTS, octodiazotracrosylane, uh, so that surface will be hydrophobic. So that the, this, co this corner, or this aperture, uh, the corner of the aperture, the edge of the aperture, will, ha will be the uh, uh, hydrophobic to hydrophilic boundaries. That's where the uh, water droplet and water to oil interface is pinned at. All right. Um, OK, slightly better. Maybe I should turn off my computer last night. Um, OK, uh, the first example I'm going to show is a temperature responsive uh, liquid micro lens. So here's the, here's the structure. These are the microfluidic channels. And this is the, where the lens is. And this is where the hydrogel is. The hydrogel is uh, below the lens. So that when the hydrogel, this is a temperature responsive hydrogel. So when the temperature goes up, this, uh, the volume will, will go down. When the uh, and when the temperature goes uh, goes down, the volume, uh, the hydrogen will, will expand. That will provide the pressure uh, to, uh, uh, to regulate the, uh, the, inter uh, the interface. Um, interesting about this is uh, it's a, the lens itself can be either divergent or convergent. It depends on the initial loading of the water droplet into the uh, small chamber. So it can, the focal length can, t uh, can be tuned from, a, uh, from negative to, uh, to positive. Of course, when, you, when, when the interface is flat, it's minus or plus infinity, so that doesn't mean much. But the more, more, most inter interesting thing is right here. That is the minimum absolute value of the, uh, the focal length you can reach. So we can get about the minus 8 to about the plus 8. Uh, the single lens can get the uh, both positive and the negative values. Um, Where's my video? It's gone. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll show the videos after after my talk. To, um, so just remind me, there's a video there. Uh, in the previous example, we used the hydro we used the hydrogel ring uh, as the uh, the actuators. Here we use uh, alternative structures using hydrogel post. The reason why we want to wanted to switch to this is that. Uh, because the hydrogel expansion is, depend is a diffusion uh, governed process, so uh, the larger the structure, uh, the slower the response. And the, uh, and the smaller the structure, the faster the response. So the, ideally, if you can get the structures very, very small, but with a relatively large surface 
uh, areas, then the response time will be much, uh, much quicker. Uh, so that's why we switched the, these structures. Basically, we have this, the, the same total volume of the hydrogels to provide enough uh, actuation force. But at the same time, we break it up into different parts to, uh, so that to increase the surface areas. So this one works too. This one, we use the pH response of hydrogels, as you can see here, with different pH values of the buffer. Uh, the, uh, the, the lens has different focal lengths, so they can uh, focus on to, uh, different things with a different distance between them. Uh, this is really bad. OK. Um, I'll just go with this mode uh, to not disturb the. Uh, um, now, we, so we showed the, the, uh, light, the, the response of hydrogels. Now, next thing is we want to make it into some medical instrument. We talk about endoscopes, and this is our prototype endoscope, how it's formed. Uh, so basically, we have the fiber bundle at the center for the image uh, acquisition. We have one set of fiber to activate the hydrogels. And because we need the fibers to activate it, we need to come up with uh, light response of hydrogels as actuation. So we came up with the infrared light response of hydrogels, and I'll explain a little bit later. And this set of fiber is for illumination. So everything is a, just a big chunk of a fiber, not a big, but a chunk of a fiber bundle. And then the, uh, the tunable lens is right on the, at the tip, at the distal end of it. Uh, so this work was, start, uh, was published in uh, APL last, uh, last year. I lost all my figures, too. Um, so light, uh, infra, infrared light response of hydrogels is basically um, the mechanism is like this. We have golden atom particles embedded into the temperature response of hydrogels. Remember, the temperature response of hydrogels, and we, when, it's, when it's heated up, the, it will shrink. When it's cooled down, it will expand. So we use the golden atom particles to absorb infrared light, because golden atom particles have a strong absorption uh, spectrum at infra infrared light. And that heat generated can be used to activate the thermal response of hydrogels. So this is uh, a standard method called the BRAST method. And um, uh, this is how we realize the light response of, oh, here it comes, uh, hydrogels. And here's the actuation mechanism. So the light comes from below, delivered by the fiber, and to, to cause the hydrogel to shrink or expand. And uh, because of that, the, uh, the, uh, the interface, the water to oil interface, will change its curvature. For instance, this is a divergent lens, and this is a convergent lens. Uh, here's the measurement of the focal length. As you can see here again, the focal length can change. And we are, in this case, we are looking at Focusing, we are looking at getting the real image, so we need a uh, positive focal length, and this is the the, the, the change of focal length versus time. Okay, it takes about a few seconds to uh, for a full scan, and the focal length goes from about th uh, 30, 30 to fifty millimeters down all the way down to about uh, eight millimeters. I hope the video show still show up. Um, this is how this uh, lens works. Uh, basically, the way we took the video is that we have two logos separated by f about five, milli um, uh, five millimeter, and as the uh, as the focal length is changed by the uh, of the lens, they will focus on to these two image planes separately at different time instants. So we should see the image. Um, no, okay, this is great. Okay. Blame Microsoft. Um, but at least the video is showing. So as you can see here, it's, uh, first we, uh, when, when, the, when the image becomes a reddish, that's, that's when the infrared light was turned on. So the, the W and the UW was scanned differently, and now it's cooled down. So it's a, it's a reverse scan. Uh, this is really. I'm sorry? It's too far along. Uh, by the way, the videos would not work. That's the problem. <laughs> OK, let me do this and see whether it can. Uh, OK. <coughs> this is bad. <laughs> OK. Um, here, I'll just talk about what, what it shows right here. It's an infrared light response of microlens array. So, 
that, uh, remember, we need the surface tension to be the dominant force for the, uh, for the uh, uh, working of the lens. So ideally, we need a large lens, all right? Because the larger lens, we have, uh, we have a brighter image field. But at the same time, the, if the lens becomes too big, then the surface tension will not dominate compared with, for instance, gravity. So what we do is that we break it apart into multiple small lenses. And this is just to show you that with that, uh, multiple lenses will pick up different areas of image. So if we have multiple lenses at the tip of the endoscopes, we can have a relatively larger field of view compared with a single lens. And uh, let me see whether I can get this. OK, all right. And this is what the system look like. Um, uh, this is the uh, schematics, and this is a real picture of the system. So we have the liquid. Uh, guide the adapter for the for the infrared light to be delivered right here and through the fibers and all, all the way go to the uh, uh, the hydrogels for uh, actuation and uh, this one is the image bundle this one we bought is a board scope we bought from uh, it's a commercial product so this is a prototype but it shows that it is feasible to uh, uh, to bundle everything up uh, to form the um, an endoscope with the tunability at the tip. Um, okay. This is hmm. Um, this, so I'll, I'll go to the next topic, which is microsensing using microfluidic interfaces. Uh, Chris, sorry, now now we cannot go to YouTube anyway, right? <laughs> because um, so it's a chemical biological sensing with dissolvable membranes and using liquid crystal interfaces, and finally with the collection of the gases and aerosol samples. Um, I love to show this picture. This is from CNN 2001, it's in September after the anthrax event. So these are sh this picture shows uh, FBI ag agents. They suspect there's uh, one of the some of the ponds in Maryland or uh, contaminated with anthrax. So what they did is to so to to drain all these ponds. That took them about 45 days, and uh, scour another 45 days to scour the sediment uh, on the on the bottom of the pond and send it to to lab for investigation. That took another 45 days. So this sensing process took about uh, four months, right? So that obviously is not what we want. We need highly sensitive and specific, low false negative, uh, for, uh, false positive, but also we need the real time automated and low cost everything. So that's the criteria we're gonna, add, we're gonna have for our microsensors. Um, it's, again, it's a very large field, uh, the microsensor uh, field, but what I'm saying is that uh, we can use controlled microfluidic interfaces uh, for, the, for the microsensing. And um, we are working on a, um, a specific type of uh, toxin called the neuro botulinum neurotoxin. This is the, one of the uh, most lethal <coughs> substance known to human being, right? But uh, surprisingly, it's, always, it's also a friend for, the, for a lot of rich people. This is where the Botox come from, uh, to remove the wrinkles. And here's the mechanism of, of, the, of the way um, this bond uh, works. So you have uh, presynaptic uh, cleft, uh, a synaptic cleft, presynaptic neural junctions right here, and the presynap presynaptic vesicles uh, containing the neurotransmitters. The vesicles will fuse at the junction to the membrane, and with the help of these proteins called the snares, it will uh, release the, neuro, the neurotransmitters into the, uh, into the cleft so that our muscle knows we need to contrast so we can move. Out, uh, move. However, if be, uh, because of the uh, presence of the bond, these bonds will specifically cleave at a certain site and a certain type of these snare proteins and defunctionize them. And without the, without the help of these snare proteins, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the vesicle cannot bond with the, uh, uh, with, with the, with the membrane, and uh, the neurotransmitters will cannot, uh, will cannot be uh, released. That's why we lost, it's flaccid, we lost the, um, uh, the movement of the muscle. And basically, that's how Botox work, right? Because the wrinkles, you release that, and the wrinkles will uh, uh, expand itself. But, well, but the point is, if we look at this mechanism, it's a very interesting mechanism for microsensing because if somehow we can come up with a membrane, a uh, micromembrane that is made of these snare proteins, and we make it into a valve-like structure. So when the bond shows up, it cleaves it, and it will destroy, compromise this membrane, and then will allow the fluid to flow between different areas. And so then we can instead detect the movement of the fluid rather than the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, 
the, the bond, uh, the protein itself. So this is a very nice way of generating, uh, ge producing large signal output or large signal uh, uh, amplification. So here's the, uh, the mechanism that uh, we come up with. So here we have two sets of electrodes, initially in air, so almost infinity in impedance, um, DC at least. And then we have the, uh, the, uh, the membrane that is responsive to this uh, toxin or the target analyte, and then there's the fluid channels. And when the fluid shows up, it does, if it does contain the analyte, then this membrane will be compromised and the fluid will show up right here. And because of the ions present in the fluid, the impedance between those two electrodes will, dro will drop uh, significant, significantly. Here's the um, uh, model system. Uh, this is our, instead of uh, two simple electrodes, we have an uh, antiple capacitor to, uh, to have a larger capacitance. Uh, these, are, these two are the, um, uh, the membranes. These membranes are not cleaved by the bond, but instead these are model systems. So these are hydrogel membranes that which can be dissolved by DTT. And this is the fluidic channels. Um, everything is made of uh, liquid phase photopolymerization. And uh, this slide shows the uh, dissolution of the membrane. Initially, it's right here, and then the li liquid shows up right here. Eventually, it starts to be dissolved, and eventually, it'll be uh, moved away. Um, I love to show these pictures because as, this, as, as time pro uh, pres uh, making the progress, you, somehow there is a, um, there's a face showing up. Um, I don't know why, but it's not reproducible, by the way, OK? Um, uh, but the, the big change is this. So basically, we have a pure capacitance at DC larger than 5 mega ohm all the way down to about 1 kilo ohm in DC bec uh, because of the, uh, this procedure. Um, so this is probably the simplest circuitry you're going to ever see uh, in, the, uh, in your college or any. Um, uh, so basically, it's the, the, we have the this is the device, which is a capacitor, and turned, turned to be a more resistive. And the out uh, external resistor, so it's very simple. Uh, serial uh, uh, connection, and uh, there's no DC output, uh, DC power consumption because unless the the membrane is cleaved, there's no current flowing through this resistor. All right, and the output is zero from 2.9. This is basically a big jump, so that's why uh, it's a very nice uh, uh, signal uh, amplification. However, at the, at the same time, we also know that it's essentially just an on and off switch. It tells you there's something going on, there is a toxin present, but it doesn't tell you how much the toxin is there because you don't know when it starts, when it, when it has started. It just take a long time for it to dissolve, and then boom, all of a sudden, the, uh, the, the switch is on. So in order to get the, uh, as to estimate the, uh, the, the, uh, the concentration of the analyte, we use multiple membranes. That's why in the initial device picture, we have two membranes right there. The membranes have different thickness. And because of that, their response to the uh, analyte will be different. Okay? So obviously, the thicker membrane, the longer the response time. And so we can track the difference between, betw uh, uh, track the, difference between the breakage of these two uh, membranes. And that will be a distinct a function of the concentration of the analyte. So if you track that, so you get a rough idea what kind of a concentration you are looking at. Um, these membranes at this moment, is, uh, previously, uh, is made out of uh, liquid phase polymerization, which is basically like a lithography. And in lithography, we know that it's very hard to make uh, high, high aspect ratio structures. And for fast response of the sensors, we need a thinner membrane, but that, which also means we need to get a very, very thin uh, uh, channels, which is not always the case. Okay? But if we make the membrane very, very thin, then fabrication will have technical difficulty. At, at the same time, also we'll have the uh, mechanical robustness issue. So we, come, uh, we uh, came across another way, elegant way of uh, uh, producing very thin membranes at the interface. And this is a method that was uh, uh, invented by Professor Moore's group at UIUC. Here we show that basically there is a little, little membrane right here, a lipid membrane. The idea is like this. Um, if we have the, uh, this glass glass, if we treat the glass surface right here, this is with gold, and we treat it with thiols. So the glass will remain hydrophilic, and the gold surface will be uh, hydrophobic. And um, because of the, these are patterns, so we have defined 
clearly define the boundary between hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Now, the water goes from here, it will stay in the hydrophilic side, pinned by here, and the other solution can come in here, and it will be blocked right there. So this is where the interface is going to happen. And at that interface, chemical reaction can happen, so we can control the time, and uh, then due to, this is called the interfacial polymerization, and that is, can be controlled by the time. For this, we can realize the uh, much thinner membranes on the range of tens of microns uh, thick uh, in a very controllable manner. Uh, the example here we showed here are nylon membranes. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this is before the membranes are, are formed, the dye solution is to go across, and after the membranes are, nanomembranes membranes are formed, the dye solution can, cannot move across. And because of the patterning of the, uh, of, the, of the gold structures, we can do a lot of things. For instance, we can do the twist of the, of the membrane, or we can make a little bit translational, so the membrane is actually slanted rather than vertical, or it can be twisted with a different angle. So a lot of things to play around. Uh, and this will be an interesting technique to make uh, the 3D uh, uh, membrane structures within uh, microchannels. So that will be the side, uh, side effect of this. Now this is for more for the real thing, the bond sensor. Uh, this is in co collaboration with Professor Beebe at UW Madison. And uh, his group is working on the chemistry. Uh, so basically, for instance, the A-type bond A will cleave right here. And uh, uh, so th what they're trying to do is that to form a sort of something like a tennis net. Uh, you have the uh, backbone and you have the, uh, uh, these pro the protein materials right here. And when bond shows up, it will cut these backbones and eventually the net will fall off. That will cause the compromise of the, uh, uh, of the, of the, of the net. The, the membrane, and that's uh, as much I can say about it. It's an on wor ongoing work, and it's uh, courtesy of Professor Beebe. I have to stress that. Uh, the second topic of sensing is based on liquid crystal. Uh, this work is in collaboration with Nick Abbott at uh, Chemical and Biological Engineering at UW Madison. Um, his group have done a, has done a lot of interesting work on using liquid crystal for sensing application. It's found that if you have liquid crystal, a thin film of liquid crystal, uh, a few microns towards about 100 microns thick, we know the liquid crystal is uh, oblong molecules, right? And uh, the orientation of the molecules is a bifringent material. So basically, the different orientation of the, molecule, of the liquid crystal molecules, the optical property will be different. Uh, for instance, in this case, if we suppose we have water, and here we have OTS treated glass, at the, at the glass, the molecules will be anchored vertically. It's called a homeostropic anchoring. And at the water interface, is planar. So it's a bifringent material. So if you have to cross polars, one here, one here, to, le uh, to linearize it. And after the polars, because you have multiple com two components in there, you have a bright image out of the uh, cross polars. On the other hand, if you trigger the surface uh, uh, using a chemical reaction to change the anchoring or change the orientation of the molecules, for instance, treated with the lipid, this is what we are going to use later, then the anchoring of the liquid crystal will become homeotropic again uh, as well. And then after the cross polars, there's only one component, right? So after two, com uh, two cross polars, you're going to see a dark image, okay? This is a very sensitive way of uh, doing chemical and uh, biological sensing. Sensitivity goes all the way down to femtomotors, uh, fem picomotors to semtomotors, not motors, picomotors to uh, femtomotors in seconds to hours, all right? But they have shown a lot of interesting work. But the, one, of, one of the main issues in their experiments is that it requires very careful and tedious manual operations. Everything you know, the, the people need to be very careful of um, handling these things because the liquid crystal is very easy to de-wet. So our, uh, we, we, we joined their effort to come up with ways to make it more devicey, make it more autonomous sensing. And uh, for the uh, last time I talked about the uh, gas sensing use DMMP, this time I showed an update using the solution-based sensing. So this happens in liquid right now. Uh, the idea is that, okay, we have liquid crystals right here. And um, uh, w the goal is to create a robust liquid crystal to solution interface. How do we do that? Uh, we know the lambda flow dominates in microfluidics, so we can have a microgrid structure, electroplated, on the, bo on the bottom of the surface, and put the, all the liquid crystals in there, and then we use fluid to sh flow through to shear away. 
the, uh, the liquid crystal on top, okay, while leaving the liquid crystal behind. And because of the surface tension, these grid structures, they will hold the liquid crystal so that will not, they will not be wet. Okay, so this is the idea. The, uh, one example, or a DTAB is a one surfactant. So initially, the water, if the water comes here, it's a planar orientation, so you have a bright image after cross polars. And when, once surfactant shows up, it will grab, pull the, uh, the, the molecules to have homotropic anchoring, and you have a dark image. And then you run w water through to rinse away all these um, uh, D-tabs, the surfactant. You resume the planar orientation on the top, and you get the bright, bright image again. So this is very, um, it's, uh, the initial success leads us, uh, led, led us to uh, this device, which is basically a grid, microgrid structure, electro, electroplated in the, uh, on the glass substrate. And on top of that, we form the microfluidic channels. The, this is nickel electroplating, and we, treat it, and we uh, sputter a very thin layer of copper for uh, chemical treatment for the homeotropic anchoring. I won't go into details. And um, here is the, uh, the setup, so basically the cross polars. Uh, this is a device, one, polar, one polarizer is right here, one polarizer is right here. And the fluid, the fluid goes in right here to shear off the excessive liquid crystals and to introduce the, uh, the analyte. Um, we use the one example, which is PLA2, phospholipase A2. This is of, currently of high uh, pharmaceutical concern because this is uh, uh, associated with many infla uh, inflammatory response in human body, for instance, arthri arthritis and um, uh, allergic uh, rhinitis. Um, the, we know that this is a PACE, okay? It's, it's a phospholipase, so we know it will uh, cleave phospholipid, and the, the substrate we have is a phos one phospholipid, the, the L DLPC solution. So basically, we introduced the DLPC solution to, to here, and initially it was planar because of water, and uh, this is a lipid, so it will grab the, uh, uh, the, 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 mo the liquid crystal molecules to, uh, to resume the um, uh, homeotropic anchoring, so that's, that's when it becomes dark. Then we introduce the PLA2. If there is calcium uh, present, then PLA2 will, will uh, stick into the defects and get to another surface. It will bind onto the DLPC, and after that, hydrolyze, uh, uh, the hydrolysis process happens, so the DLPC will be released. This is what is shown right here. The DLPC goes, uh, goes away. And because the DLPC goes away, the, uh, the liquid crystal is not being grabbed anymore, so it's, it resumes the planar orientation, and then you get a brighter image. On the other hand, if there's no calcium, then this uh, process will not happen, so there's no interaction. So this, is, uh, so this is a control system, basically, with and without the calcium. And this is with the 10 uh, nanomole, and it, it can also go down all the way. Uh, Professor Abbas group have shown, using other structures, uh, go down all the way to pickle mole. Uh, pickle mole. So it's a very um, sensitive um, mechanism. How much time do I have? Okay, all right. Um, uh, I mentioned briefly uh, earlier that a lot of people are uh, focusing on sensing itself. That is, um, uh, once you, uh, you assume that a sample, you, that the analyte comes to the sensors, then you can sense it, which is fine. But on the other hand, sometimes uh, the, the bottleneck is how to get the sample to the area where the sensor is. Uh, for that, we need uh, the acquisition systems. Um, so we're interested in gas, gas sample collection or airborne uh, aerosol collection. Uh, and the, the, uh, the, uh, the approach we're taking is that we form the microfluid interfaces, uh, the liquid to air interfaces. So the samples will get in there, will be collected by the streams, and will be flowed down, downstream to where the sensor, uh, sen uh, sensing area is. Okay? Um, the principle is actually very, very simple. It's, uh, it's sometimes called a virtual wall. It's basically, if you have hydrophilic areas and hydrophobic areas, in this case, there are, two, there are uh, intrinsic hydrophobic polymers for the patent, and then you form the hydrophobic, hydrophilic uh, boundary. So this boundary will sustain the fluid flow. So if you have a water-based solution flowing in, and uh, as long as the pressure is not too big, it will be pinned right here. And then, because there's it's a virtual wall, there's no physical wall to block the uh, uh, the entrance of the uh, samples in the air to the fluid. So now it's a it's a sampler that can get aerosols into it, can get gas samples into it. Okay. So this is the uh, the, the principle. And uh, 
we used uh, uh, the, the reaction with ammonia and the nested region as a model. So ammonium, is, of course, is a gas sample. So we, we run, this is fluidic channel, we run the uh, nested region um, into, the into the channel and then from this side, we exp ex uh, it's exposed with uh, ammonia. As you can see here, it starts to react uh, and the, the, the reaction goes all the way deep into the channel itself. So uh, this is the electronic version of it. Uh, so basically the, the resistance of the channel, because of the chemical reaction, the resistance will drop. Um, so it shows that this, ch this side walls does have the capability to, uh, to collect the uh, gas samples. Um, we also came up with another interesting way. Uh, so it's basically that we have two uh, pinning sections because we have two boundaries, two hydrophilic to hydrophobic boundaries. It turns out we, can only, we only need one. That is, suppose we have an, the glass slides, a glass slides with a hole right here. Here's the physical corner, so it has the pinning effect. All right? And so the water comes in here, will be pinned right here. And uh, as, as, the pressure go, as the pressure goes up, this, this interface will just move along. As long as the pressure go, do, do not, does not go over the board, then you have an air pillar formed within the structures. And then you can blow your air into this device. So the aerosol, sample, uh, aerosol particles will be collected by these um, air pillars. But remember, these air pillars are isolated. So you have a continuous flow within the channel. So the flow flows from here to here. So what it does is that effectively collect all these particles and flow the downstreams, which is seen right here. So initially, it's, there's nothing there. And then we blow the, uh, this Kool-Aid. We blow the Kool-Aid against it and eventually collect it using syringe pumps. And you can see here, you see the purplish uh, color. So this is an interesting device we're still developing. Um, to, uh, for, uh, for aerosol particle collection. And of course, this can be used for uh, uh, air sample uh, collection as well, gas, gas sample collection as well. All right, uh, the final topic I'm going to talk about is the um, adaptive microfluid cooling uh, using autonomous micropumps, which was published in Lab on the Chip last year, uh, no, the, uh, 2007. Uh, the motivation is thermal management is not, is not just for microelectronics, it's also for biological microfluidics. Because in, the microflu uh, in the biological studies, you, all, you, need to, you need to have good control of the temperature, and sometimes you need very good in situ control of the temperatures. Um, so if you can have some kind of on chip temperature controls, that'd be great. And so we were thinking about. Uh, one interesting mechanism, uh, we know we have temperature response of hydrogels, and these hydrogels will expand at cooler temperature and shrink at a higher temperature. So how about we come up with a structure like this? So we have a nickel, pillar, uh, nickel impeller, and there's a central post, a uh, hydro post. But this hydro post is temperature responsive. So if the temperature is low, it will expand and provide enough a friction force to, to forbid this impeller to rotate. On the other hand, when the temperature becomes high, that's where the cooling comes from. When the temperature becomes high, it will shrink, and then the impeller will have enough room to move around, then we can rotate. And for a nickel impeller, we, can just, we, we only need an external magnetic field to rotate it, right? So this can, this can be easily provided by a magnetic stirrup. So this is the, the uh, mechanism of this whole thing. It's autonomous because it's triggered by the local temperature in that environment, in the local environment, rather than the external, externally being controlled. The, the only thing we need is the constant magnetic field that, is, that exists over there. And the operation on and off operation of this impeller is going to be decided by the local temperature itself and by the hydrogel actuators. Okay. This is the uh, uh, system uh, configuration. So the impeller is right. The impeller is right here. This is actually two, two layer. So the water goes goes from here to the reservoir because it, if it's away from where the heat is generated, it will be naturally cooled down through the heat dissipation to the uh, to the air uh, to, uh, to, to the environment. So the water goes in from here and will fall, it will drop onto the impellers, and the impellers will rotate, and that's essentially a pump. So we'll, because of the, centrif the centrifugal force, it will drive the fluids away and get into the second, uh, second layer. Okay? Uh, and here's a close-up of the structure. So you can see here, when temperature is lower, it's expand the hydro expanded, the pole is expanded. When temperature is higher, 
then the central post is, uh, is shrunken. Um, the cold reservoir is kept at room temperature, it's around 25 degrees, and uh, the hydrogel, the temperature responsive hydrogel intrinsically has a uh, onset point about 32 degrees. Uh, we can tune that, I we will see a little bit later. But So here's just the structure. Um, I'll show the videos later. Um, this one shows the, um, I don't know whether we can see it clearly or not, this shows the operation. So basically this one is that we turn the heater on and uh, turn it off, to turn the heater on, turn it off, and visually we do see the impellers uh, uh, rotating or not rotating. And this shows the cooling effect. So when the temperature goes up to the uh, designated uh, temperature, the impeller will, will start to rotate, will pump the uh, cooler uh, uh, fluid into the, uh, into the area and to, uh, to suck the heat out. So that this is the, t the difference, the cooling effect. So we're running, we have about uh, uh, four degrees, for uh, maximum four degrees in these devices. And for other geometries and the store of frequencies, we can get to up to about seven degrees of cooling. Uh, in the, um, uh, in the, in the lo uh, local area. And we have different uh, dimensions of the uh, impellers, different uh, geometry of the impellers as well. It turns out the, uh, the uh, geometry is not a big issue, but the, the store of fre frequency, that's the, um, the frequency of the magnetic field, uh, plays a, a more important role in the operation of this. Um, as I said before, the intrinsic onset point of uh, thermal responsive temperature is 32 degrees. How about for other temperatures? Well, we can chemically, that's the nice thing about the hydrogels, that is theoretically you can do, chemical uh, do some chemistry about it so that it can be responsive to anything. In this case, we add a small amount of a map tech, um, a, uh, a chemical, into the um, NIPA, the thermal responsive hydrogels, and then we can shift the, uh, the onset point of temperature. So he, for this case, for instance, we can have um, the response uh, onset point, uh, LCST, the lowest uh, critical solution temperature, to, from 32 degrees to 60 degrees. And because of that, the pumping on and off uh, initially is 32 to 27, is shifted to 60 to 55. So we, we are able to program these impellers to be respond, these micro pumps, uh, to respond to different preset temperatures for, for, cooling, uh, for cooling's purpose. All right. Okay, uh, summary. Uh, so this is what we have done. And I want to leave some time for the video, so I won't go, back, uh, go through. And I need to thank a lot of people, my group members who contribute to this work, and the current group members who helped us, the money, of course, and uh, 3M for my uh, fac non-tenure faculty award. I wish to thank Professor Bibi and his group for collaboration on liquid microlenses, uh, microfluidics, and dissolvable membranes, Professor Nick Abbott and his group on liquid crystal-based sensing, Professor Eric Johnson and his group on, uh, on sensing uh, related to bond, and the research group of Professor uh, McCown uh, in our department for assistance, and his group, as his student, uh, in fiber optics. And I thank all other people and facilities to make this work um, possible. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, let me get to, let me get out of this uh, shameful Microsoft product. Is your wireless on? Maybe it's, it's on, yeah. Maybe it's searching for a connection. Sometimes my laptop does that. Yeah, okay. it chews up memory. Or it's, just, or it's possible because the mismatch in the, uh, it's possible to have the mismatch of, yeah. uh, with the projector. Okay, so this is the video I showed, which managed to work. Kudos to them. Um, so that's it. Uh, the second one is okay. Here's another video. Um, so basically, these are different lenses with different diameters. Thus, with the same hydrogel actuation, same pressure, they will have different focal lengths at, a, at a, given the same time instant. So as you can imagine, if, it, if they are looking at the same things because of different focal lengths, they are going to focus at a different depth. All right. So it's sort of uh, uh, somewhat like a stereoscope in some sense, because you are looking at uh, different depth of focus at the same time using different lenses. Um, okay, let me get back to my other talk so I can, to my, to my videos to show you. Oh, where is I thought I got this prepared well. It's, uh, it really disappointed me, and I apologize for that. Um, where are my other videos?
Okay. How about this? Okay. Uh, is true? No, not uh, this one. Not uh, this one. Not uh, this one. Should be this one. Okay, how about this? This is the root. This should be the... Uh, that's interesting because the, um, the media player will not come out. It is playing. Is there anything to expand it down there? Eh? Yeah, you have to expand it. Here, right. Ah, wonderful. Okay, thanks. So we do have people who can address Microsoft's issues, right? So, OK, so this is the, uh, the, the video showing the operation of the thermal responsive um, uh, microlenses. This is oil. Uh, water is down there, not, uh, not, not visible. This is the uh, polymer aperture of the lens. So we have the water, uh, water to oil interface right here. Um, so we load it up initially so that you can see the water bulging up. So it's actually a divergent lens. And when the temperature goes, When the temperature goes up, where is it now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, when we, we use a microheater locally to heat it up, so the hydrogel will shrink, so the oil will drop into the water, that will become a convergent lens. Then, then remove the microheater to let it cool off, so the hydrogel will expand back and squeeze the, the water back into its original uh, place, the shape. The structure of this lens is relatively large. The diameter is about two, uh, two millimeters, so the response time is around the range of the 10 seconds. Uh, that's the, uh, and we use a hydrogel ring, so that's why the, uh, we are using the hydrogel micropose right now to, uh, to shorten the uh, response time. Okay, so that's the first one. Um, pH lens. So this one shows the, uh, the two lenses, two pH responsive lenses put together. They are exactly the same. The only difference is that they have two different responsive, uh, pH responsive hydrogels. One expands in acid and shrinks in base. The other one expands in base and sh shrinks in acid. So their response to the uh, buffer with different uh, pH value will be different, will be just the opposite to each other. Um, and uh, this video shows the, uh, uh, the focusing uh, of the lenses. So we have two structures. One is a, a small bead. Uh, the other one is the needle, the tip of the needle. They are separated by 1.4 centimeters. So as you can see here, this is pH responsive lenses. So when the, P uh, the buffer comes in with different pH values, the, uh, the image planes are that are focused on are different. Do I have, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, the problem is I need to find it. <laughs> um, because uh, all these are nicely embedded into it. I, did, I actually forgot where they are originally are stored. Um, so it's not here. Where is it? Where am I? Where are my videos? <coughs> cannot believe this. I cannot find my videos. Hmm. Should be in these talks. Well, this is unfortunate. I cannot find those videos. It, it's got to be buried somewhere. But well, what we'll do is okay. Let's thank right. uh, uh, My apologies on this. Uh, yeah, my laptop really dis disappointed me today. But there's time for a few questions, and then maybe right after the talk, we can find videos. Okay. All right. Well. Okay. So let's open the floor up for questions. Steve. Please. Yeah, Steve. Uh, you showed us the lens being activated using various methods, optical, aperture, pH. It looked like the response time's about the same for all these different methods. Is that 
true? Yeah, that's about right because there are two mechanisms to um, uh, to active the the hydrogels. It's, it both eventually boils down to ionic diffusion. So one is that you use the temperature, you raise the temperature, so you ionize it, and the ions need to diffuse into and out of the interstitials. And the other one is uh, is direct, is more direct. For instance, pH. That's you provide the ions into and out of it. So it's diffusion based. That's why they are about the same because uh, you give the pretty much the similar geometric structures, uh, 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 thickness of the membranes, you know, structure-wise, they are similar with each other as well. So that's not. That's expected. Yeah. That's a very good question. Um, there are, for instance, one is aberration. Definitely, we are studying that. Uh, we didn't show the uh, numbers, but our, the uh, spherical aberrations, for instance, of our lenses is comparable with most of the other technologies. It's not as good as all these are custom made because to reduce spherical aberrations, you need to come up with a specific shape. For instance, the, uh, it's more cur curved towards the, uh, towards the center because it's, uh, uh, because you have less power uh, toward the center and the less curve towards the edge, right? But uh, most basically, the micro technologies cannot provide you with that kind of uh, luxury to do that. You need a custom, you know, uh, grind and polish it. Uh, but ex uh, ex except that, uh, in terms of uh, micro lenses, in a broader term that is produced by other technologies, we are basically the same. Um, not terribly good, not terribly bad either. It's about ballpark values right there. Our goal is to reduce the, uh, the micro, the, uh, reduce the size of the microactuators. So this is the first time the microactuators is actually smaller than the lens itself. In the in other previous cases, you need much larger actuators to provide the force to change the uh, curvature, for instance. And that's the key for the success for the endoscopes, for instance, because we just cannot put, the tip is very small already. We're looking at about five millimeters. We just cannot have a big chunk of uh, actuators at the tip to uh, uh, activate the lens itself. Any other questions? Well, I think in the, in the sense of time, I think we should thank Professor Jang one more time. Thank you. Um, thank you.